Greetings everyone and welcome to this walkthrough video for assignment 3 where we will be writing some SQL queries using Microsoft Access. Now the reason I use Microsoft Access for this assignment as opposed to Oracle which we'll be using for most of the rest of the semester is because while you may not always have the ability to interact with an enterprise database server like Oracle or Microsoft SQL Server as you progress through your career, it is very likely that you will have Microsoft Access installed on your computer. So while Access shouldn't be used as like a enterprise database for your entire company, it is a very powerful tool for you to be able to use on your own to do some analysis. So that's what we're demonstrating here in assignment three. Now, one thing I will point out is that in order to really demonstrate and take advantage of the power of Microsoft Access is that we are going to be writing all of these SQL queries by hand. Now, there is a graphical query tool in Access called QBE or Query by Example, uh, where you can just kind of point and click and drag and drop attributes and Microsoft Access will write the SQL code for you. Now, while this is uh, perhaps a little bit easier way to query the database, you're going to lose out on a lot of the power and functionality that we're learning in this class. So you're not going to be able to get the full benefit of using Access. Also, when you use the QBE tool, it creates SQL code that is uh, quite different than what a human being would normally write. So it's quite obvious that that is what has happened. And also it's going to be more difficult to make modifications to that SQL code. Uh, so it's a lot better to just start from writing the SQL queries totally by hand. So let's go ahead and get started. And of course, this is the assignment file that you will download off of Blackboard. And also as part of the assignment is this store3.accdb access database file. Now, when you double click on this to open it, you'll see that you'll get this yellow bar at the top that says security warning, some active content has been disabled. Now, you'll often find this warning on a Microsoft Access or Microsoft Excel files that you download off of the internet uh, because there is the possibility that a malicious individual could inject some, uh, some code into these files that could uh, have damaging effects on your computer. However, I promise you this is not the case in this uh, particular instance. So just go ahead and click on this Enable Content button. And here on the left side, we see five tables, imp store, employees, products, stock, and stores. And these are the same tables we see here in this diagram, which is very similar to an entity relationship diagram that Microsoft Access has automatically generated for us. So we have some products, we have some stores, and we have some employees. And then stock is basically a gerund that decomposes the many-to-many -many relationship between products and stores. And imp store is a gerund that decomposes the many-to-many -many relationship between employees and the stores that they are assigned to work in. So this is uh, the starting point that we're going to, uh, uh, going to have here. In Access, if you double-click on these tables, you will see them open up. So here are the... Uh, 18 employees that we have working uh, in one or more of our stores. And you can see here at the bottom uh, the number of records. Now, one question that commonly comes up is, uh, what is this record here at the bottom that just has zero and has an asterisk over here? So this isn't actually a record. This is not an instance in our, uh, in our entity or in our table. Uh, this is just a way that Microsoft Access will let us insert new data without going through the process of writing a SQL statement. So we could actually type in all of an employee's details here or all of a product's details in the product table or what have you. So uh, those are employees. We have a whole bunch of products here that have an inventory ID and a price associated with them. We have a couple of stores in uh, different cities in different states that each have phone numbers and have a, uh, an ID of the manager. So this is a foreign key 
that refers back to the employee's table. So this is the employee ID of the manager of this store. So the store number one in Nashville, Tennessee, the manager is uh, employee 1002, which is this uh, Duncan O'Neill individual. In the imp store table, uh, this is the gerund that links your employee IDs to a store and then has the date that they started working at that store. And then the stock table is a gerund that uh, decomposes the many-to-many -many relationship between stores and all of the products that they have in inventory and the quantity in inventory. Okay, so for example, store one has a uh, product 115 and has 25 units of that. Okay, so the store in Nashville, Tennessee has product uh, coffee mug, which has a price of $5 no matter what store it's at. And we have 25 coffee mugs in stock. So that's the kind of lay of the land for these tables in our database. So to get started, let's go ahead and take a look at number one. And I've actually already completed this one for you in the assignment file as described in the slides that go along with the uh, class lectures in order to write these queries in Microsoft Access we're going to go up to the create tab and click this button that says query design now in this window that pops up here this is the interface for doing the uh, query by example thing and if we select uh, some of these tables and click add. We see them show up here and we have these lines indicating our foreign key relationships joining these tables together. And we could come down here and select different fields from different tables. This is the query by example process and uh, like I mentioned before is not going to give you the same power and control that you're going to have by writing your own SQL queries. Uh, so we're not going to do this. Let's go ahead and just close this and uh, let's start again. I'm going to click on the create tab, click query design. And when this window pops up, I'm just going to hit close and uh, do nothing here. Now notice in the top left hand corner of our access window, we have this uh, button that says SQL. So if we click on this, now we have an area that we can write some SQL queries. So I could say something like select asterisk to get all attributes from, and then the name of one of our tables like employees, and then click on this red exclamation point here that says run. And this is going to show us all of the uh, data for all of our employees. And as uh, described in the question, we actually don't want to just see all of our employees, but we want to see them ordered by last name. So let's go ahead and modify this SQL query just a little bit uh, so that we meet that requirement. So to get back to our interface to write the SQL queries, if you click on this little drop down or this little triangle here for the drop down under view, you see we now have three different ways we can look at our uh, at our data the data sheet view which is this the sql view which is what we're interested in or the design view which is the query by example thing that we're not doing so uh, for the most part during this assignment you're going to be alternating between data sheet view which is the results and sql view which is where we're writing our sql code so in order to uh, fix this query so that we're ordered alphabetically by last name. I'm just going to add the order by clause, order by L name. And then when we run this, we see we get all of our employees ordered alphabetically by last name. Acosta, Delgado, Fry, Goff, Hell, Hatfield, and so on, just as we see in the assignment file. So at this point, we would just take a screenshot of this and paste that into our document. So inside your submission file, you just need to have the text of the SQL query that you ran and the screenshot of the output. Now, one problem I will point out that you may encounter at some point is if you make some kind of typographical error, right? So instead of the L name, you just put name, which is not one of the attributes in the employee table. When you try to run this, 
you'll have a window pop up asking you for a value for that parameter. And uh, this is if we are trying to dynamically create queries and pass some uh, values into it, we can do that. Uh, but that's not what we're doing here. So if you get a window that pops up like this, you know that you probably have a typo in uh, the name of one of your attributes. All right, so moving on to number two, uh, this question asks us to select the first name, last name, city, state, and phone number for all employees living in Mississippi. So there are just a subset of attributes we want to project here, like we don't want to get their address or their employee ID. So we're gonna make a few modifications to our SQL code here. We're gonna say select F name, L name, city, state, phone from employees. And again, we can spread SQL queries over multiple lines. Our spacing doesn't really matter. So just to make things a little bit more readable, I'm gonna go to the next line here. Uh, so select F name, L name, city, state, phone, from employees, and now we want to get our employees that live in the state Mississippi, which is abbreviated MS. So there are two ways we could do this, and I'll show you uh, both of the ways. Uh, the most common would be to say where state equals, and then uh, in single quotes, MS, like that. And when we execute this, we see that we have these, uh, looks like about seven employees in the state of Mississippi. So we can do our print screen. Take that, paste it over into our document. And then also make sure to remember to copy and paste your SQL code into your assignment file. Uh, so we would want it to look something kind of like this, that doesn't need to be in bold. So this would be a great submission for your answer for number two. Now, another way we can do this is instead of using the equal operator, we could use the in operator to uh, find values of this state attribute that are in some set of values that we provide. Uh, so we could say where state in, and then in parentheses, provide this set of values that we're checking against, right? So this is going to give us the exact same output. And if we were interested in finding employees in multiple states, you know, this might be an easier way to do that, right? Because we could pass in any number of values. But either one of these approaches, whether you say state equals Mississippi or state in uh, this set of values that includes Mississippi, both of those would be correct. So that is uh, the solution to number two. Uh, moving on to number three, things start getting just a little bit trickier. Uh, this question says, for each store, display the store's address, city, state, zip, the manager's first name and last name, and the manager's phone number. So the two things that are a little bit tricky here is that we are going to be getting data out of two different tables, stores and employees. And so we're going to have to join these two tables and we'll see two different ways to do that. But then the other tricky thing is we have some attribute names that are the same in both of these tables, like address, city, state, zip, and phone. Uh, we have that for stores, and we also have those same attributes for employees. So whenever we are referring to these attributes, we're going to have to put the name of the table that the attribute is coming from before it. So in the question, it's asking for the stores, address, city, state, and zip. So we're going to refer to these attributes as store.address, store.city, store.state, and store.zip. And then the manager's first name and last name. Now stores don't have a first name and last name, so we can just say F name and L name for that, uh, but we will have to say employees.phone number. So let's get started writing the query, and we can just use this same uh, query window, or if we have closed that, we can go to create query design and uh, just kind of start over there. So let's start by uh, getting our attributes from the 
store table. So I'm going to say select uh, store dot address store dot city store dot state and store dot zip. Let's just start by looking at just this. So we'll say from stores. Oh, and you see I've made a mistake here. Um, yeah, stores, not store, is the name of the table. So let me go back and fix that. Okay, great. So now we have just these attributes about the store that we are interested in. And now we need to bring in some data from our employees table. So uh, here after stores, I'm gonna say enter join employees on stores dot, and uh, let me double check, I believe the name of this attribute yes, is manager, okay? So we want stores dot manager to be equal to employees dot, and I believe we called that imp ID. Yeah, imp ID. Okay, employees dot imp ID. And then we also wanted to project some attributes about our employees, like their first name, last name, and phone number. So since we don't have an attribute called F name or uh, L name in the stores table, we don't have to put anything before that. Uh, but then for phone, since both stores and employees have phone numbers, we do have to specify that we want employees dot phone. Okay, so select the stores, address, city, state, and zip, and the manager's first name, last name, and phone number from stores, enter join employees on stores.manager equals employees.impid. So when we run this, and here's another thing that you might uh, run into is, oh no, our exclamation point is gone. We don't have the uh, run button here. Uh, if that happens, it's because you've gotten onto the wrong tab here. So if we click on our design tab under query tools, right there is our run button. So we'll click on that. And we see here we have uh, our stores and the name and phone number of the manager that manages that store. So I'm going to go ahead and take my screenshot here. I will paste that here and then go back to my SQL and paste that right here. So this is uh, solving this question using an inner join. Another approach to do this would be to use to create a Cartesian product and then uh, select only the records where stores.manager equals employee uh, dot imp ID. So the way that would look is if instead of putting inner join right there, you could say uh, from stores, comma, employees. And if we stop right here, we're actually going to get a really weird result. It's going to be every possible combination of store and employee, regardless of that manager status. So when we run this, you see we get well, it looks like 90 rows in return, which is far more than the number of employees we have or the number of stores that we have, right? And in fact, this 90, um, that is going to be five stores times 18 employees, five times 18, that's 90, right? That's the maximum cardinality of joining employees and stores. That's kind of the worst case scenario of every possible combination and that's what we've done here. That's not what we want. Uh, that, is, uh, that is incorrect. Okay, so if we do this Cartesian product, we need to add another statement uh, to say where manager equals imp ID. And now when we do this, we see we get the exact same result that we got uh, from doing the inner join. So again, this is just two different ways to write this query uh, to get the same result. And we'll see things like that over and over again as we progress through our study of structured query language.
Moving on to question number four, and this one is just a little bit more straightforward because we are only going to need to get data out of one table, in this case, the products table. So we're going to, uh, we're going to get the names and prices of all products with a price over $40, so we have a where clause there, ordered so that the most expensive item is at the top and the least expensive item is at the bottom. So we're going to use our order by for that. So we're going to select, and we don't need all the attributes, we just need the name and price from products where price greater than 40. So let's just uh, take a look and see where this gets us. Oh, and I've messed up once again. Uh, I think the name of this attribute, it's actually not name, it is product. So we need to select product, comma price from products, where price greater than 40. When we run this, ah, excellent. We see we have only a, a couple of products here, throw rug, hat rack, knife sets, and things like that. Um, but we also specified that we want the most expensive item at the top and the least expensive item at the bottom. So we want these in a descending order of price. So let's uh, add a little bit to our statement here. We're gonna say order by price. And when we run this, this is better, right? We are in order by price, but this is kind of the reverse of what we're looking for. We want the most expensive item at the top and the least expensive item at the bottom. So we want this in descending order. So we actually wanna say order by price, D-E-S-C, for descending. And when we do that, excellent. Yes, we have all of our products with a price over $40 uh, in descending order. So let me grab my screenshot of that. And we'll paste this over here. Again, make sure to copy your SQL query. And there we go. And of course, if we wanted uh, products that have a price that is less than $40, it's just a simple change to our statement there. And uh, we would see all of our uh, less expensive products. All right, now moving on to question number five. And I think we're going to need data from a couple of different tables here. We want to display the inventory for the Memphis store. And in this, we're going to display the city, product, price, and quantity with the items listed alphabetically along with the price and quantity in stock. And if we can't see everything in one screenshot, that's fine. We just want to see uh, at least the first 10 items. So let's get back to our SQL view here. And uh, we want the city, product, price, and quantity. So we're going to select uh, city, product, price, and quantity. And I believe to do this, we're going to need uh, some data out of our stores table, right? That's where we're going to get the uh, name of the city. We're going to need some data out of our products table. That's where we're getting the product name and the price. But then to get the quantity, we're going to need some data out of this stock table. So this is how we're determining which items or which products are at the Memphis store and also the quantity that we have in stock. So we're going to be joining three tables together. So let's start with product. We're going to uh, select city product price quantity from product, enter join stock on and uh, in the stock table and the gerund, it's this inventory ID. That's how we're creating the, the join. So we're going to say on products.invid equals stock.invid. And if we just stopped at this point, we're just joining these two tables together. However, we also need... Uh, some data from the stores table. So we have to join another table to these two tables that we're joining together already. 
And in order to do that, we need to wrap some parentheses around this first join that we're doing to kind of illustrate that uh, this all kind of goes together and is essentially creating a new relation that we're going to now join another relation to. So we're joining uh, product and stock based on this criteria here. And then to that, we're going to enter join uh, stores on stores dot store ID equals stock dot store ID. And when we execute this, um, oh, I believe uh, actually this should be products, not products. See, even uh, even I make errors in my SQL code. Now we have every one of our stores and all of the products that are carried uh, by, by each of those stores. So this is our many to many relationship that we're seeing uh, in practice here. But we were only interested in our Memphis store. We don't care about uh, Nashville or Tucson or any of these others. So we need to add a where to this. We're gonna say where city equals Memphis. Now when we do this, we see only our, uh, our products in the Memphis store. But additionally, we wanted this ordered alphabetically and we see that's not currently the case. So we need to make one more little addition here. We're gonna say where city equals Memphis order by product. And since we want it in alphabetical order and not reverse alphabetical order, we don't need the descending command here. Uh, so here are all of the products in our Memphis store. So let me go ahead and grab my screenshot for that. And then make sure I also copy my SQL code. And make you to make this all fit on one page. I'll kind of shrink this down just a little bit. That's fine. Or as described, uh, you could just crop this so that you only see the first 10 items. That would also be okay. Now, of course, we could also do this using the Cartesian product, right? We could say from uh, products, comma, stock, comma, stores. Now, if you stop right here, you're going to have a big problem. Uh, when you run this, this is going to give us every possible combination of products, stock, and stores. And uh, you see, this comes out with 3,380 rows, which is a lot, right? And we see, gosh, a lot of repetition, right? Because this is every combination of the city, the product, and uh, and the stock so you get a lot of uh, a lot of weird repetition here so this would be incorrect if you were going to use the uh, cartesian product like this you would need a couple of more elements in your where clause right here uh, you would want to say where uh, products dot id equals stock dot id and uh, stores dot store id equals stock.store ID and city equals Memphis. So these two expressions here will kind of transform that Cartesian product into the equivalent output of an equijoin or an inner join. Okay, so this gets us the same result that we uh, saw using our inner join. Again, this is just two different ways to write a query to get the same result. All right, now moving on to number six. This, uh, this is another single table uh, question here. Uh, we want to get the name and the price of all products with the word water anywhere in the name of the product. So at this point, we're only going to need data out of our products table. So uh, we could select 
uh, product price from products. And then we're looking for uh, products that have the word water anywhere in the name of the product. So we could say where product, that's the name of the product. And if we just said equals water, I don't think we're going to get anything, yeah, nothing at all in our result. We're looking for products that have the word water anywhere in the name. And you might think about just putting an asterisk before and after water. And if we do that, we see we still don't get anything in our result. And that's because, as you might remember, in order to use these wildcard operators of our asterisk, we use not the equal operator, but like. Okay, so we're going to say where product like, single quote, asterisk, water, asterisk, and then close our single quote. And then when we do that, we see a dog, water bowl, and water filter. So those are our two answers there. Uh, I'm going to print screen. Copy that over into my document. And of course, remember to get my SQL query as well. And that is number six. For question seven, we're going to be switching gears just a little bit, as all of our questions so far have been reading data out of the database. And in this instance, we're being asked to write some data into the database. Now, one thing to keep in mind, if you are, for whatever reason, using Oracle to complete this assignment, as opposed to Microsoft Access, you will not be able to insert this data. The tables that uh, you have access to in Oracle are read only, so we're not gonna be able to insert. Uh, so if that is the case for you, then I'm going to ask that you just provide the SQL statement in your document, but you won't have to run it. So in order to insert the data, we're going to, instead of saying select from, we're going to insert into, and then the name of the table that we're inserting data into, in this case, employees, and then a comma delimited list of the attributes we are inserting. So in this case, that's imp ID, F name, L name, address, city, state, and zip. And I'm just getting that list of attributes uh, from what is in the employees table here. This is what we're, uh, we're inserting. Oh, and I forgot phone, city, state, zip, and phone. I'm glad I checked that. Then we'll have the word values, and then in parentheses, a common delimited list of the values. So in this case, for employee ID, it is 9999, so 9999. Uh, F name is Molly, L name is Smith, address 125 Timber Lane, and we have to wrap that in single quotes as we did first name and last name because those are uh, character string values. The city is Oxford in Mississippi, MS, the zip 38655. And even those, though those are numbers, this is not something we would ever do any kind of math with. So it uh, makes more sense to store that as a string of characters. And same for phone number, um, 3245. Close our parentheses there. So insert into employees these attributes, the word values, and then these values that correspond with those attributes. So we'll run this. We get a message that says we are about to append one row. So we're writing one row into our table. I click on yes. And now if we double click on employees, we should see, yes, we have a new employee here Molly Smith. So I'm going to copy this as my answer for number seven. And one thing I will point out, once you have run this command once with this employee ID of 9999, if you attempt to run that again, 
you'll actually get an error message because now we're trying to insert a duplicate value for this uh, primary key of imp ID. So uh, we don't want to do that. So if you wanted to run multiple or insert multiple employees, you would just need to ensure that they all have a different value for imp ID. Now, number eight is also a query where we are going to be writing data. Uh, we currently have this new employee, Molly Smith, but she's not associated with any stores. So what we want to do is insert a row into the imp store gerund um, in order to associate this uh, new employee 9999 with a store. And it's the Tucson store that we are interested in which is store number three. Okay, so let's, uh, again, we're going to insert into, and in this case, we're inserting into imp store. And the attribute names are imp ID, store ID, and start date. So we'll say imp ID, store ID, and start date. And our values are 9999, and we said the store was 3, and the start date is going to be 3-23-2019. And so now when we do this, we are about to append one row, so we click yes. And now we see that this new employee 9999 is associated with store 3 with this start date. So I'll just copy this over into my assignment file. Okay, number 9. We want to make the employee created in step 7, so this is Molly Smith with an employee ID of 9999, the manager for all stores in Mississippi. Do this using one SQL command. So we see we have uh, two stores in Mississippi, and uh, they currently have two different managers, 1013 and 1016. So what we want to do is update stores and set the value of manager equal to 9999, where the value for state equals MS. Okay, so let's, uh, let's give that a go. So instead of select and instead of insert, we are going to update stores set manager equal 9999 where state equals MS. And when we execute this, it says we are about to update two rows so we can click on yes. And now when we look at our stores table, we see that we've updated the manager for both of these stores that have a value of MS for the attribute state to be 9999, just as we, uh, just as we wanted. So that is great. So let's copy and paste this to be our uh, answer for number nine. And again, this is something you wouldn't be able to do if you're uh, running this uh, assignment in Oracle, uh, but you can just provide the SQL code here and that will be fine. And then finally, number 10, for each store, display the address, city, state, zip, manager's first name and last name and manager's phone number. So we just want to see the, uh, the stores and the manager after we've made this change. And notice that this is actually the same question that we had way up here in number three. So we can actually just copy and paste what we have already done here. We'll run this again. And now we see our updated manager for these two stores in Mississippi. So let's uh, do my screenshot once again. Paste that into my document. Just the same SQL statement we ran for question three.
All right, so that is it for assignment three. Hopefully you found this to be interesting and informative as we learned how to run these very powerful SQL queries in software that is uh, most likely on your uh, computer now and work computers that you will have in the future. So good luck and with this knowledge, go forth and do great things.